Boy, it's a joy to know that there's something better than what this world offers. That there's a land beyond what we can see. (laughs) A place that we can call home. A place where we can dwell and we can bask in the glory of God for all eternity. Man, do you ever get jealous of those who've gone on before us? Oh, I wished I was there with them. (laughs) While I'm here, I'm going to enjoy life as much as possible, but I've got a home in heaven (laughs) that I'm waiting to be in the presence of my Savior. Uh, When you're ready for home, you you won't let anybody talk you out of going home. The more... I live on this life, the longer I live in this life, the more I'm, I'm convinced of what thus saith the Lord. And those who are false teachers, they've just, they're wasting their time with me. <laughs> I've read too much, I've studied too long, and I, I've spent too much time with the Lord to, to fall prey to some of the stuff that people are trying to push down our throats. You know, we were here Thursday night, just a few left. Most had, had gone home and, and had one lady say, you better preach the truth. <laughs> you better preach about Jehovah. I said, I'm preaching about the deception of false teachers. She said, are you calling me a false teacher? (laughs) I just looked and smiled. When she left here, I believe she was convinced that I was convinced that she was a false teacher. We'll share a little bit more about that. If you're turning your Bibles to 2 Peter 2, 18 through 19. Just these two verses, I, my plan and my desire was to preach the rest of this chapter in this, ver- in this message. But I understand that there's a lot going on this afternoon. I, I understand there are several places some of you are going to try to get to this afternoon. And I, I really appreciate you representing Reedy Branch and, and, and being concerned about these families. So I'm going to do my best to get out of the way. And for what my part of this is, it's not going to be very long, but, but we're going to let God have his way. Uh, he's given me what he's given me, but we're going to let him share it in the way that he wants it shared. And and so hopefully I won't be before you long, but nevertheless, I want his will to be done. In chapter 2 of Second Peter, in verses 18 and 19, we, we are following up on what we've already shared. We, we've shared the past several sermons that false teachings are destru- destructive. The false teachings are destructive because the false teachers are depraved. We've shared that with you. We, and today we want to share that false teachings are destructive because the false teachers are deceptive. The truth is false teachers have a charisma. They have the necessary gifts to deceive people. They have the gifts to lead people down to destruction without people even knowing what's happening. Sadly, those who believe the false teachers will be judged with them. So believing the so-called experts, it can sometimes kill you. Our Daily Bread put out the following on March 2nd, 20th, March 20th, 1980. Mount St. Helens in Washington, a supposedly dormant volcano began to quake and rumble. The local population was evacuated to a safe distance of eight miles away. Later, the the side of the mountain began to bulge. The scientists, they, they weren't alarmed. They weren't afraid. They weren't concerned because past research had showed that volcanoes, they never blew sideways. Then on May 18th, two days short of two months, the side of Mount St. Helens exploded, shooting tons of debris 
downhill at the speed of 150 miles per hour. One minute later, the volcano exploded upwards and with the equivalent power of 500 atomic bombs. 230 square miles of forest was devastated or devastated. 57 people lost their lives. The scientists had assumed that natural events would continue as before, but they were wrong. Believing this false information caused destruction of property and destruction to lives. Today, we turn our attention to the fact that false teachings are destructive due to the deceptiveness of false teachers. The Bible says in verses 18 and 19, for when they speak swelling words, great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who actually escaped from those who live in error. While they prom promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Hmm. This is God's holy word. God, we come before you today to thank you. To thank you for your presence in this place. To thank you for assuring us in this place that you are on your throne and you are looking down upon us. You're extending your grace and your mercy. Help us, God, to look up to you and to worship and praise your name. That, God, we would glorify you, magnify your son. Help us, God, as we come before you to speak these words that you have shared in a manner that be pleasing unto you. And God, help us to allow your Holy Spirit to minister to each one of us who are here. And God, if there's one who doesn't know you, who doesn't have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, let this be the day that they cry out to you, what must I do to be saved? God, we're looking to you. We're going to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we see in this paragraph that Peter warns his readers of how deceiving false teachers go about deceiving people. They are deceptive in the way that they actually deceive people. What we see here in these verses are a model or we see the strategic plan that's used by false teachers and this same plan is used today. It wasn't just used during the time in which Peter was writing. But we see it's still employed today. And what we see from this model is it's used to entrap certain people. These false teachers, that is their goal. And I don't even believe some of them realize that that's what their goal is. I, I, I'm convinced that once some are caught up in the midst of false teaching... They're at a point, they can get to a point to where they actually believe it and are as or more passionate about what they believe than we are. The problem is, is that their belief is in something that is not real. And because of that, it's going to destroy them. So what we notice in this passage, we notice the entrapment that's employed by false teachers. The te false teachers use a strategic plan to entrap followers. They use, first of all, appealing language. We see that right here in verse 18 where the Bible says they speak great swelling words. The King James uses the word boastful. He says that they speak boastful words. They, they use lofty, flowery language. They use descriptive phrases. They, but the problem is that everything that they're saying, using these big words, 
is empty. It's empty. It's vain. It's nothing. It means nothing. In other words, what they're saying is just not true. It's their own ideas and opinions. The problem with it being simply ideas and opinions is that they offer no hope. And I've come to terms with this in this life that whenever we're facing trials, whenever we're going through temptations, whenever we're struggling and, and we're, we're facing death, we need something that's real. We don't need to see anything empty. We need something that is real for us. We need truth. We need something that we can hold on to that will carry us through those struggles. You know, that's something we find in the truth of God's word. These empty, unstable ideas and opinions, they're going to all end with the grave. And they can't and they won't carry us from the struggles of this life into the joy of eternal life. Only Jesus Christ can do that. He can do it because he is truth. And if this is true, and I believe it to be true, and the teacher's messages deny Jesus Christ, there is no hope of heaven. And, e and if there is no hope of eternal life in the presence of God, then we have no hope at all. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 that if in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are all men most pitiful. In other words, if we don't have hope of spending eternity with Christ, then we have no hope at all. Amen. Because this life is going to end. And if our hope in Jesus is only here on earth, then we're already in a mess. But not only do we see that they use empty words or lofty words or, or words that really mean nothing. They're intentional about who they seek. They prey on the weak. The Bible says here that they allure through the lust of the flesh. These false teachers entrap people with lustful schemes and, and lustful filth. They they prey on those who have actually escaped from those who live in error. In other words, they've actually escaped the world and now they're being preyed on by false teachers. In other words, they're the false teachers are preying on the immature and the young believers. And folks, this is a warning that we can't be settled with just being saved. We can't be settled with just coming to church and sitting on a back pew. We can't be settled in, in just, I, I, I'm going to make it in. You know, I've heard people all my life say, well, if I make it to heaven by the skin of my teeth, well, I got news for us. There's no skin on your teeth. And we're not going to make it in by the skin of our teeth. We're going in rejoicing or we're not going in at all. Amen. That's the truth of God's word. People say, well, if I could just have a little corner in heaven. I want to tell you, the Bible declares that there are mansion in heaven. And he's prepared a place for us. I want to tell you, I got a dwelling place. Not just a little corner. I got a place reserved for me in glory. We can't, we can't come with the idea of thinking that... It, I, I, I'm saved now. I'm okay. And no, we've got to grow. We've got to develop. If not, these false teachers are going to prey upon us. Yes. We've got to be rooted and grounded in the Lord and in God's word. If for us to be rooted and grounded, we must be consistent in studying God's word. We must be consistent in following God. It's our only defense against the wiles of the devil. It's our only defense against these false teachers. So we got to do more than just get saved and sit down. We got to get involved. Because the more we're involved, the more relationships we build, the more accountable we become. And the more we find ourselves desiring after the, the pure meat of God's word. And the more we receive the meat of God's word, the stronger we are and the more mature we become. And the greater stand we'll have with Jesus. <laughs> Here, their strategic plan, it involves the use of swelling words. It involves praying on the weak, but it also involves false promises. The promise of freedom, 
that only enslaves people. That's what they're promising. We must know that sin always enslaves. And let's remember the false teaching in the text, the false teaching that the text is centered around. is that It's referring to the teaching that denies Jesus Christ as Messiah. And to deny Jesus Christ as Messiah is to deny God's word. And to deny Christ and God's word is to deny the supreme, the supreme authority in our lives. And, and why would anyone want to deny the supreme authority in our lives? Well, that's simple. It frees them up to live any way they please denying Jesus Christ frees us to seek after the pleasures and the possessions of the world and, and the entrapment here is that no matter how many pleasures we experience no matter how many possessions we, we gain it, it, we, we can never have enough we're going to always want to seek more and seek more and seek more and the more that we want to seek more the more we're entrapped by this world because we take our eyes and our attention off of Jesus. We become a slave to the world. Let me share this encounter and this may help unpack a little bit of it for you. On Thursday evening, as I said earlier, almost everyone had left. Iola was here, Taylor was here, I was here, another couple and then this small family. They were here. We engaged in conversation with one lady. She was extremely friendly. She was funny. She was engaging. Our conversation began to be very pleasant. However, she noticed that we very quickly realized what she was up to. <laughs> she spoke about church in a way that that got us engaged with her, but her real motive became a very apparent when she referenced God. As a matter of fact, she looked at Iola and Taylor and said, I see your faces already. You already changed your expression because we knew where she was at. <laughs> we realized that she was a Jehovah's Witness. Now, no one had said anything offensive to her. No one had had done anything to make her not want to be here. But she began, once she realized that we recognized this, <laughs> she tried to bait me. Her whole demeanor and everything about her changed. She tried to bait me into a theological discussion or argument here on our premises. When she couldn't bait me, she began to insult me. And then she insulted the church. I stood, I smiled, and I, I let her talk. Listen, folks, I know the Bible tells us to be ready to give an defense of our faith, but you can't always feel that you must argue with people about your faith. If you can't keep your cool, it's better to remain silent. Because strength and character will be revealed in the silence. Titus 3 and 9 says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. And I knew it would be useless and unprofitable to argue with this lady. One thing I knew that I didn't want to bring a reproach upon this church, and as soon as I would argue with her and lost my cool, she would have been able to go out and tell whoever she'd come in contact with, well, the pastor at that church, he said this, this, and this. See, I'm growing along with the church. <laughs> We're all growing together. Uh, you remember, I've told you from time to time that knowledge is power. Well, this lady had no idea I had power over her. <laughs> you see, as soon as she, as soon as I was to have argued with her, I'd have lost everything within me. I'd have become Hilton. And Hilton didn't need to show up. I'd have gave her so much ammunition that you would have heard about it. And you would have had issues with me. So this didn't happen. So she decides when she insulting me wasn't baiting me enough. She insulted the church. Now she did this very subtly. She didn't criticize the church. Let me tell you what she did. She, her words were, we... Speaking of her group, we are the only ones who do what Jesus said do. I know what you're thinking. 
I know exactly what you're thinking. Yeah, they go out and they visit, but I, I, got, I want to help you with that. I want to help you with that because you're going to be bombarded with that. And right now you think they do that better than anyone else. Let me tell you there's a motive behind that. <laughs> and it's not a pure motive. The truth is she just had no clue on how wrong she was. She had no idea at how she had been deceived and she had no idea of the trouble she was in because listen they do what they do because they have a works based faith and in case you didn't know a works based faith is an oxymoron because if it's works based it's not faith Amen. They do what they do in hopes that they can do enough to get to heaven. And folks, that's not why we do what we do. I want to tell you, that's not why I preach. Because I already know my home's already in glory. you wondering if I'm going to get to heaven. That left me the day that I got saved. Jesus has promised me a home in heaven. I'm not working in hopes I get to heaven. I'm going to heaven whether I work or not. There's nothing that can change that. Not enough devils in hell that can change the fact that heaven is my eternal home. Amen. Ours is a faith. It's because we know heaven is our home. It's because we know that God, what God has done for us. It's because that he has already given us eternal life that we do what we do. In other words, by faith we believe. And because we believe but with love and graciousness and appreciation for all that he's done, we do what we do. That's faith. That's not works based. That's faith. She went on to say, well, no one can choose who goes to heaven. Only God can. Oh, but I've read too much. <laughs> I've studied for too long for her to come at me with that. There is no truth in that. God has given us the choice of whether we live in heaven or whether we spend an eternity in hell. He's given that choice to us. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to us. God allowed he, our sins to nail him to a cross. He allowed us to pluck the hair out of his face. He allowed us to beat him. He allowed us to curse him. He allowed us to spit on him. And he, allowed his, he allowed us to put a crown of thorns upon his son's head. God allowed his son to commend his spirit into the father's hands. God allowed him to be, to lay down his body so, so you and I wouldn't have to. He allowed his son to be buried in a grave and God himself on the third day raised him up victorious, conquering death, hell and the grave. God done all of that and then placed the choice of spending eternity with him in our hands. So we choose where we spend eternity. God would have it that all would receive eternal life. God wants everyone who's ever been born in the, on this earth to spend eternity with him, but he gives us the choice. The choice. He placed that in our hands. <laughs> so, <laughs> John 3 and 3, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3 and 16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The choice is ours. Yes. Do we believe? <laughs> oh, I'm glad this woman couldn't entrap me. <laughs> I spent too much time with Jesus. I spent too much time in God's word to fall prey to the false teachings that deny Jesus Christ. The question is, could you have easily been trapped? I encourage you, if you could, to spend more time in God's word. Spend more time with God in prayer to get involved in what God is doing in the church. Psalm 1 and 1 through 3 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits at the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be, listen, folks, when we get in love with God's word, when we get in love with spending time with God, when we get in love with God's work, we shall be like a tree 
planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaves also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Oh, folks, don't fall prey to the entrapments of this world. Don't fall prey to the entrapments of these false teachers. These false teachers will lead us to become entangled with a world that will destroy us. But you don't have to be entrapped by these false teachers. Know Jesus. Love Jesus. Serve Jesus. Oh, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I pray that no one in this place would ever be entrapped by the lure of the lust of the flesh. I pray that you would never be entrapped by the lofty words that people may share. I pray you would never be deceived by false promises. I pray that you would know Jesus as your Savior. That you would fall in love with knowing him, which means you would fall in love with his word. And the more you get to know him, the stronger you become. The greater witness you are. And when these false teachers come with an attempt to entrap you, you can stand firm on your faith in Jesus Christ. But if you don't know Jesus is your savior, you're subject right now to these false teachers. You're subject to Satan using his army, his principalities, his rulers of darkness, his spiritual host of wickedness. You stand subject to all of those coming before you, seducing you, convincing you, and later destroying you. But you don't have to remain where you are. If you'll come to God as you are, trust his son as your savior, you'll leave a changed man or a changed woman. You'll leave different than the way you come. You'll leave from being a sinner to being a saint. From having a home in hell to having a home in heaven. he had changed your life from being a man or woman of this world to being a man or woman of God. But the choice is yours. He's laid it in your hands. He said, I've done everything. I sent my son. I allowed my son to be killed. Allowed my son to lay his life down for you. And I raised him from the grave. I have brought him back with me and I'm sending him back to receive his bride. Now the choice is yours. Do you want to be part of the bride? Or do you want to be part of the world? Oh, if you want to be part of the bride of Christ, just simply pray this prayer with me. God, I know that you are God. And I know that you created this world. God, you created this world perfect. And we messed it up. And God, even in our mess, you come to our rescue. And you sent your son to die for me. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he's the savior of the world. I believe he'll save me if I call upon him. I call upon you, Jesus, to be my Lord and Savior. Separate my sins from me. Cast them as far as the east is from the west. Save me. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for loving me in spite of who I am. Now help me to serve you as you would have me to. I want to be your son. I want to live with you forever. Thank you 
for giving me the privilege. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, if you've prayed this prayer, you believe this prayer. I believe you've done enough, but that's not good enough. You've got to know that you know that you know that you've been born again. If you're sure of that, as we start to sing this song of invitation, I, encourage, I ask you to come and tell me that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior.